Well, this is an exciting series, and I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's going to be on God's Word centered over Psalm 119. But there's a few verses, a few chapters that I wanted us to look at before we get into that about God's Word. So if you'll stand in honor of the reading of it, it comes in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. The sacred writings are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Again, we come to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and thank you for your word, the Bible. We love you. In your name we pray, amen. When I... Uh, met Jesus as a little boy I heard in church every Sunday bits and pieces of God's word but it wasn't until I sat down in my life later at around age 30 and began to open it and read it not for a test run to be able to see what God really had to say to me personally it changed everything in my life everything changed and God's word came and I began to experience how much God loves me it leads us to salvation it gives us the wisdom to lead us to salvation and once we are saved it equips us for our journey here on this earth to know truth and to know right from wrong it's God's Word the Bible said Peter said in 2nd Peter 1 19 through 21 we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention is to a lamp shining in a dark place Till the day dawns, the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy ever was made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. We need to pay attention to it. It needs to not just be a Sunday book. If it's a Sunday book, we can go to heaven if we know Christ, but we're going to die an anemic Christian. It's our daily bread, and God wants us to know truth from it and he wants us to be able to pay attention to it you know when we talk about the Holy Spirit speaking to us and we need to understand from cover to cover it's God's Word not part of it little stories of people tell me well, you don't really believe there was this whale and this boat that a guy named Noah built they, yeah yeah I believe it and I believe it to be true and I believe it happens it's hard for me to comprehend but I believe it because God said it it spoke from God and God in his spirit has fruits to give us and there's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness, gentleness, all of those fruits. And there's an opposite side called the flesh and it's immorality and strife and jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, envying and drunkenness, things like these that God says. We need to look at our heart and well, God, why would you want to write this book? Because he cares about us. And he wants us to be, know that he wants to be involved in our life and to help us with our battles. The forerunner before Christ was John the Baptist. He came on the scene and he bumped into a dude called Herod. He was the ruler, Henri dude. Killed people, just Henri. But the Bible says in Mark 6 verse 20, when Herod heard John, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. We can enjoy listening to a preacher and listening to God's word. Many preachers will tickle people's ears so they'll come back. But he was also very confused with it. And when he began to be convicted by Herod with truth, see, he was living with his brother's wife, he cut his head off. And it was the end of things. But many crowds began to come to John the Baptist. It says in Luke 3, 10 through 14, the crowds were questioning John, saying, well, what do we do? And he was answering, say to him, the man who has two tunics is to share with the one who has none, who has foods to do likewise. Some tax collectors and came to be baptized, and they said, well, what are we supposed to do, teacher? He said, well, collect no more than what you've been ordered to. Soldiers came and questioned him, said, what about us? What are we supposed to do? And he said, don't take money from anybody but force. 
or accuse anyone falsely. Be content with your wages. Now that letter in purple there, what do we do? That wasn't how to be saved. You don't work your way to heaven through good deeds and, and doing good events in your life and good works. It was once we've met the Messiah, what are we supposed to do with our life before heaven starts? And that's why we come to God and we open his word so that we can learn truth. What's your plan for me? Now, the, the little lie that Satan gets away with, and there's some truth embedded in it. See, Satan can bring some truths of God's word, twist them around a little bit, but is, well, you don't have to. Once you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. You get to go to heaven. It's not based on whether you open this book ever in your life, and that's true. But you will never learn the truth about what we're supposed to do as a Christian. And we'll die an anemic life Paul talked to the people at Galatians. They were Christians in Galatians 4, 9, and he said this, now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, so it was a genuine relationship, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to be that you desire to be enslaved all over again? That question in green, how is it that you turn back again? Now, there's a lot of reasons that that can happen. It can be, well, I kind of like that joint I just smoked. That got me a little bit high. It was a little passing pleasure, but I liked it. But the biggest reason that we turn back, I believe by far the biggest reason that it happens is because we don't have our armor and our protection and our sword from God. It's not our daily bread. We get, and we get weak. If you don't eat today, you're not going to die. If you don't eat tomorrow, you're not going to die, but you're going to get weaker. Same way spiritually, it's our daily bread. And he wants us to have it and he wants us to take it to heart. There's a song that we sang, I wish I would have wrote it down and celebrate recovery. And it was embedded with amazing grace. And it was, my chains are gone. My chains have been broken. I'm set free. And I stood before everyone Thursday night and I said, how is it that somehow we get our chains back on after we become saved? Why does that happen? Satan can't put them on. God certainly wouldn't put them on. We choose, and we get ourselves off track. Paul asked that question. Now, this Psalm 119, this chapter, is the longest book in the Bible, the longest chapter in the Bible, embedded right at the center as if God was saying, hey, I want you to know my heart. I want you to know the Bible in its entirety, but there's jewels in this chapter that help us come to know the complete and perfect will of God. I told Amy and Jack this last night over at their house, went over for supper, gave them a little glimpse. In our alphabet, there's 26 letters in the English alphabet. In the Hebrew alphabet, there's 22. It's important for us to know because in this Psalm 119, there's 176 verses in this chapter. It's broken down into 22 segments of eight verses each. 22 times eight is 176. Each one of those segments, those eight verse segments, begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The next eight begin with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In the first eight verses, every one of those eight verses begin with that first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In the second segment of eight, each verse of those eight verses begin with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now that's interesting, didn't know what it ever meant. I always saw those little names of the Hebrew alphabet at the top of those segments, but I never knew what that meant. And it is the entirety and the completeness of God's enduring word and the perfection of it. So now we're gonna start into this and you're gonna see several words. We know what the word commandment may means. We know that that's something Moses gave, but there's words in there called precepts and ordinances and statutes and testimonies. And I never knew. I thought, why don't you just stick with the word commandment and make it easier for me? God wants us to understand why he put those words in there and what this means to our life. So as we begin this journey in Psalm 119, verse 1, the very first thing that God tells us, how blessed are those whose way is blameless who walk in the law of the Lord. There's a blessing in God's word. I used to, and you've heard me say this many times, when I wanted 
Charlie and Amy, my children, before they left home, I wanted them to take it to heart to read God's word in their home, in their life when they left for school. I wanted them to know the value and the treasure. And I would talk to them. I said, we had a little cedar chest at the top of our spiral stairs. And I said, if there was a, a $100 bill taped in the lid of that, and every morning if you got up and you got opened it to see what was in there, that would be yours. What would you do? Well, we'd open it every day. It wouldn't matter if it was 2 in the morning, that the rule was 2 in the morning. We'd get that because there's something of value. There's a blessing that God has to give us. Now we look at that and we say, yeah, but your, words, your way's got to be blameless. None of us are blameless. Christ is the one that's blameless. We're always on the right path when we follow Christ. There's landmines out there. He wants us to abide in his word so that we can know truth. Now, as you look at this on your handout, you're going to say, I don't know how my Bible doesn't read the same way. This here is the New American Standard. Some of the verses are King James. Some of them are the Holman Bible. Some are New King James. But you don't see that spelled out in your handout. So that's why they may read a little bit different. How blessed are those whose way is blameless. Listen to how it says it in the Holman Bible. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who live according to the law of the Lord. I heard a preacher one time, he said, you're not really supposed to be happy as a Christian. You're not going to be happy as a Christian. I'm thinking, where have you bumped your head? We're going to heaven. Christ hung on that cross and died for our sins so that we would never go to hell. It doesn't mean we're not going to have heartache and persecution and things go wrong on this earth, but we ought to be the happiest people alive. We ought to be thankful that God has sent his son, that he loved us so much. And we not only want to walk according to God's rules, we want to live according to it. We want to live the word. We want to have it in our heart. I heard this little story. And I thought it was cute as could be. I got to read it, Amy. A former president of the United States was making a public appearance when a man at the edge of the crowd caught his attention. The man had long, flowing white hair, a long white beard. He wore a long white robe. He had a staff in one hand and some stone tablets tucked under his arms in the other hand. The president, struck by the man's appearance, told his Secret Service detail, I want to talk to that guy. Agents cleared a path to the man. The president asked him, aren't you Moses? The man ignored the president and turned his head the other way. Unaccustomed to such treatment, the president moved to a position himself right in front of the guy, made eye contact, and asked him, hey, aren't you Moses? The guy turns his head again to the other side. Frustrated, the president tugged the man's sleeve and demanded, I said, aren't you Moses? Finally, the man answered quietly, yes, I am. Well, how come you've been ignoring me, the president asked. The man replied, well, the last time I spoke to a bush, I had to spend 40 years wandering in the desert. <laughs> we know the story didn't go exactly like that, but God wants us to be happy. He wants us to know the truth. Now, after he tells us that there's a blessing for our lives in this book, and you know, Satan don't want you to ever go to church. And he don't want you praying. But I believe the top order of business that he never wants to happen and take hold of our lives is for this to be your personal love letter from God and you to open this book in your home daily. He will fight that tooth and nail. And one of the reasons we fall for it is because but it's not the ingredient that's going to let me go to heaven. I know I'm saved. But we'll never have the abundant life. And he tells us in the next, next two verses, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. There's so, something about us loving God with our whole heart. Now, what's this word testimonies mean? Well, if I give my testimony this morning, it's my life story. It's what I've been through. It's my journey. God's heart in here is him revealing his heart to us of his nature and who he is. And we want to give him our whole heart. And we want to seek him as we open his word. Not just to be able to get things from him. The Bible tells us in the next two verses, you have commanded, and we see two new words, 
that your precepts be kept diligently. If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes, then I would not be ashamed when I think about all your commands. Two new words, precepts and statutes. Precepts are the instructions from God. One thing that drives Rita crazy is if we get something new and it's got to be assembled. Well, she can give me the command to assemble it, and God can give us a command, but the precepts are the instructions, and that's the part I don't ever want to look at. I can put this together. You don't need all these pieces. We got to follow God's instructions. If he tells you that we shouldn't have outbursts of anger, he's going to tell us in the book how to do, how to, how to avoid that. When he tells us the command of not to steal, he's going to tell us embedded in here is the gems and the nuggets and the treasures of how to go about pushing that back. Well, what about the statutes? to keep your statutes. Well, if we get this thing and it's to be assembled and Rita gives me the command to assemble it and I decide to pull out the instructions or the precepts, then there at the bottom is, here's the tools you need. And if it says you need a flat screwdriver and I decide to take a Phillips screwdriver, I can turn on that screw all day and I ain't gonna be able to put that thing together. So the statutes are the tools you need to follow the instructions of the command that God gives us in his word. And we're not going to know how to not lust. We are not going to know how to overcome fear unless we take this book serious and we say, God, teach me how to do it. And it's not like a light switch that, well, I'm going to read for one day and I'm going to expect the whole package to come in. It's our daily bread. Now, the Bible says in the next verses, in 7 and 8, I will praise you with a sincere heart. When I learn your righteous judgments, and I'll keep your statutes, never abandon me, God. There's a praise that flows from our hearts. You want to help me. You want to be involved in my life. You care about my life. Now, what about this word in green, his judgments, a new word that comes in there. We just had the whole series on heaven and hell, and we're going to face judgment one day. But that's when we get to heaven. What about this down here? This judgments he's talking about is our earthly spiritual report card. God telling us, if we hold our heart out and really seek him, how am I doing? Tell me where I'm getting off base. Show me what I need to learn, God, to follow you. And I don't want to pick and choose. When, it's, when my friends are telling me at school it's fine to have sex before marriage, I don't care what they say. I want to know what you say, God. Even though it may change the course of my life, I do not want to tear that page out. I want to know truth. And I want to keep all of your tools that you give me. What does it mean when he says, never abandon me? Jesus made it clear that he'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. You know what the psalmist is saying here? Continue to teach me. I want you right by my side. I want you to be there when I wake up and to guide me. And I'll tell you how it works with God. All of us, I think, pray because we need stuff. God, I need some stuff. I'm having a test at school this day, difficult deal at work, got some health issues. We can come to God for those things. But his word, our prayer is us, that better be God calling. <laughs> our prayer is us talking to God. His word is God talking to us. And if we just end with the prayer thing and we never get around to open this, it's a clear signal and we, we, we tell God in so many words, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to do all the talking. But I don't have time to hear from you. We will never, ever find the heart of God through just asking for it. God's heart's breaking. He said, I hear you asking for it and I've written it down. And I want you to know. I'm reading in the Old Testament now in Ezekiel. Makes my head hurt. Don't understand most of it. But it doesn't hinge on whether I'm going to continue to read the Bible just because there's parts of it I don't understand. He begins to reveal it to me over time. The Holy Spirit will always tell you the truth. Never abandon me. Continue to guide me and tell me the truth. And he always will. And we trust God. There's a reason this country put in God we trust on our currency. 
There's a spiritual light goes on inside of us that we begin to understand, I can always rely on you that you're going to tell me the truth even if it hurts. You have my best interest at heart and you know how to talk to me and help me. Now that's the end of the second, or the first set. Seven, one through eight. We're moving now into the second set, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it starts with this. We all know this verse. How can a young man keep his way pure? Big question. How, how could that be possible? By keeping it according to your word. And with all my heart I've sought you and don't let me wander from your commandments. God, I'm prone to get off course. Don't let me just read. Uh, James said, don't just be a hearer. It's fine that we're opening it and beginning to hear it, but we want to be a doer of it. And why would that be? My mom and dad, they love me. My dad always told me, he said, son, there's a hard way and there's, a, there's an easy way and a hard road. Easy road and a hard road. You always are insistent on taking the hard road. And it broke his heart. And I always thought, you don't know how to have fun. This is a new generation. You don't know what's going on at the parties. You just want to deprive me from having a good time. And now when I look back, I think, I know. Hey, you love me. You care about me. God cares about us, and he wants us to be able to understand why. I'm so thankful. Rita, as our kids grew up, two important things to her was their diet and exercise, that they learned to eat nutritionally and that they exercised. Didn't take a hold too good yet with me, but... It's important because she wanted them healthy. Well, God wants us spiritually healthy. And he wants us to know about our daily bread, that he is there every day and he'll feed us every day. All that we will inhale, he will breathe life into our nostrils and help us. Psalm 119 verse 11 is one we all know. It's one that we teach at Vacation Bible School. Thy word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We tuck it down inside of us. I don't always know what verse it is and where it's at, but I know, and it ties together like a thread God reads through his Holy Spirit through my heart and the life, and it gives me hope, and I know truth. Now, when we hide something, it's usually because we don't want someone else to find what we have. I like the way... New American Standard says this same verse, Thy word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. This treasure that we found, you know what God wants you to do with it? He wants you to share it with other people. If we keep it hidden in our heart, and, and I understand what the Bible is saying there, we meditate on it, we, we memorize scripture. It's the only thing that lasts. Someone grabbed Amy at the hospital, it was a doctor, said, hey, I saw that verse out there on your sign. Tim had put it up. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Amy, Amy, what does that mean? What does that mean? Heaven and earth will pass away. Amy said, well, I'm sure glad Dad just had a sermon on that, so I know that the heavens, the moon, the sun, and the stars are all going to pass away, and this earth's going to burn up, but God's word's forever. And it's our daily food. And he wants us to know truth. And there was a real truth in this. Oh, here it is. Worries you when it's almost gone like that. You all have it happen too, but you don't have to get up here in front of everybody. With the treasure that we talk about, it's the only thing that lasts. God talks, Jesus talked about why we store up so many treasures here on earth. Because moth and rust, we ain't taking none of it to heaven. It's not wrong to have things, but when it becomes the focus of our life, we're missing the abundant life. There's only one thing that lasts, and it's God's word. I was working on the sermon. We got these things Cliff talked to me about when we built this church, a new thing coming out called LED bulbs. They're supposed to last like forever, 30, 40 years, depends on which one you buy. I'm working on a sermon. Got them all through the house. They use electric, less electric. Doesn't bother me when Rita leaves every light on in the house and closet. But my little light over where I do my sermons didn't come on. I had put an LED bulb in and I'm going to throw the whole fixture out. I thought it can't be the bulb. I thought, well, maybe before I throw it out, I'll just change the bulb. Sure enough, that bulb didn't last a year. Now, maybe it was defective. 
But you always wonder when they invent something, how they know it lasts 15, 20 years. Who said that? You don't know until the time's up. But God's word, that treasure, lasts forever and he loves us. The next verse is say, Lord, may you be praised and teach me your statutes. And with my lips I'll proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. We never need to judge someone else. It's the wrong thing to do. We need to love people and we need to care about them if they're getting off track. But we don't need to condemn them. And I want to praise you, God, and I want you to teach me truths. And I want to proclaim the truths of your word. Next verses say, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. And I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways and I'll delight in your statutes and I shall not forget your word. It becomes a delight to open God's word. Now I'll tell you in the discipline that I have of doing that, sometimes, sometimes I catch myself rushing through it. I'm kind of tickled. I read a chapter in the Old Testament, chapter in the New, and I move through Bible, come through, circle through it again. That's how I read it. And in the evening and night before we go to bed, Rita and I read together. But sometimes when it's a short chapter, I'm kind of tickled. This ain't going to take too long. That green word is the hard word, meditate. To ponder on what you're reading. To come to God, spend a little time, camp out. What does this mean, God? And, and guess what, Lord? Every once in a while I do lust. And I'm so sorry. And I want the instructions on how to not do that. And help me, God, and I want to think on what you're telling me. And I want to hide the verses that you show me in my heart so that I don't do that. God's testimony. Christ's testimony of what he's done. Now, our last little segment in our third set, we're going to go through that. It's just going to take a few minutes. But otherwise, we've gone through a certain amount at early service and not as much in late. We'll be starting different places. The third set, third letter of the Hebrew alphabet starts with this. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. People tell me sometimes, I, I did a little test run. I read the Bible for a week, and you know what it did, Charlie? Made my head hurt. Didn't understand none of it. I said, I don't understand all of it. But it's not a test run. It's a decision that when you understand, you hung on that cross and you bled and died for me and you've asked me to do this. I know there's good in God's word for me and I know there's blessings there and I want that for my family. But you know the biggest reason I do it? Because God's heart is at stake and I want to love my God. And when we disobey him, whether it's not doing it daily in our daily bread, it hurts his heart because it didn't have time for me today. And guess who's by your bed? When you wake up, Satan, every day, he'll be there. He's like a roaring lion. And we need God's word and we need his help in our life. Open my eyes means give me understanding. One of the reasons it makes our heads hurt sometimes and we don't get anything out of God's word is because we just open it and start reading. Before we ever lay our eyes on the first word, there needs to be a prayer. And it doesn't have to be some canned prayer. God's not interested in that. But it needs to go something like, God, please send your Holy Spirit to help me understand what I'm about to read. I don't want this to be my mind unraveling because I'll make it fit my rules and my lifestyle. Please give me understanding and help me to obey you. And God hears that prayer and our eyes begin to come open in our heart and we see this may be difficult for me to change course and to obey you, but you're going to give me everything I need and you're the best for my life. The next two verses say, I'm a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all time. Now there's a new word, ordinances. It means the ordained guidelines, the roadmap, the spiritual boundaries that God puts in our life to help us see when we're beginning to get off course. We're a stranger in this earth means this is not my heavenly home. Paul said there's a war inside of me now that I'm a Christian. 
I find myself not doing the things I always am supposed to do and doing some of the things that I'm not supposed to do. Who's going to set me free? Christ is going to set us free, but he, I began to understand the world has a different set of rules than God has. Many a Christian has sat and pondered on this thing of the right or wrong of abortion. God will help you understand. It's a life. It is a baby. And he wants us to know truth. And it doesn't matter what government or what president or what authority tells you something different. God's word is truth. And it never changes. And I'm so thankful for his heart. He says in the next two verses, you, you rebuke the arrogant, the cursed who wander from your commandments. Take away reproach and contempt from me, for I am observe your testimonies. Now that was a hard verse for me. Rebuke means to reprimand. God is the judge. God is the avenger. You know what those two words, reproach and contempt, mean? Reproach means to insult someone. Contempt means to look down on them or despise them with disgust. That's what happened when the woman caught in, caught in adultery came into church and they all picked up the rocks to condemn her. The psalmist here is saying, God, you're the one to reprimand people. Help me know truth and as I bring truth and we are to come alongside and restore someone that's off into sin through God's word, but we're not supposed to do it with reproach and contempt to look in disgust on someone. We remember that Christ has saved us and that he loves us. Now our last verse, last verses in this third set tells us, even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. Goes along with the same verse before. It's as if God saying, I'm not going to let governors, presidents define truth. It doesn't matter how many states pass a law that changes God's plan on what marriage is to be. God's truth tells us that it's to be between a man and a woman. We don't need to look down in disgust or contempt with anyone just because I haven't committed that sin. I committed all the others. Christ is the washer of our sins, but God is our counselor and he is the one that defines truth. So even though princes or governors or presidents talk against us or tease us for a stand. God, you're my counselor, and it's a delight to know your truth. And Father, a lot left in this chapter, and Satan knows your word and deceived Eve in the garden and Adam, just twisted a little bit that there was something better than God had to offer. God, we need your word. And you want to tell us that you love us and you want to give us hope and truth. And I thank you, Jesus, for dying for us and for being our Savior. And help us, God, to take it into our homes. We don't want it to be a Sunday book. It's our daily bread. And we thank you for it and for revealing your heart to us and for holding us and picking us up when we mess up and caring for us. And someone here today doesn't know you. God, help them to come to know you today. And we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray, amen.